The Lab on Digital Societies. Welcome to the new episode of D Lab on Digital Societies. I am your host, Christoph Jodi, from the Faculty of Economic Sciences and D Lab at the University of Warsaw. And it is my great pleasure to talk with Agustin Kokola Gantz. Agustin is a research fellow at the Institute of Geography and Spatial Planning at the University of Lisbon. Before joining the University of Lisbon, he was a Marie Curie Fellow at the School of Geography at the University of Leeds. He holds a PhD in Human Geography from Cardiff University and a PhD in Art History from University of Barcelona. His research lies at the intersection of urban and tourism studies and pays particular attention to the short-term rental market, gentrification and tourism-led displacement. Welcome to the show, Agustin. Hello. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, really, really nice to, to have you on the show. And today's topic is short-term rentals, one of the, your main research interests. And you have been studying short-term rentals and also their impact on the real estate market. Can you explain to us how platforms like Airbnb change the game? for renters, buyers, and the real estate market in general? Well, such a, such a big question. So I, I want to provide a bit of context first. Basically, uh, my, my research and, and the places where I have lived has been mainly in Barcelona and in Lisbon. And especially in Barcelona, the, the like short-term rentals existed uh, before Airbnb. So there is a long history of short-term rentals as a, as a product, uh, like an alternative to hotels. Uh, Airbnb was created in 2008 and um, popularized this product, the short-term rental. And so it's a, it's a platform that connects landlords with uh, uh, renters. So now a uh, housing supply, which is local, like in this one on Barcelona, is available online through this platform. So it facilitates the transaction between these two, these two parties. Apart from this, in cities such as uh, Lisbon and Barcelona, tourism was like a solution for the recession after the 2008 economic crisis. And so also the state facilitated uh, a, low, a lot this, this market. They liberalized the rental laws in both places and created a, well, a, a system, like a legal framework that, that made possible the, the, the growth of this, uh, of this market. And it's also interesting to, to say that bef even before Airbnb in, in, in Barcelona, Short-term rentals were already a point of contestation by social movements. So there were there was already Barcelona is a mature destination. The question of over tourism in Barcelona is has a long history since the beginning of the twenty first century, and before Airbnb, uh, there were already people in the city center complaining about the growth of short-term rentals and the impacts on housing markets and also on neighborhood uh, life. Uh, and just to, to finalize this contextualization, just to say that in, a, in cities such as Lisbon, nowadays this market has grown so much that we have neighborhoods in the city center where 70% of homes has a short-term rental title. In, in Barcelona, it's not so big. In Barcelona, there are 9,500 short rental licenses. In Lisbon, there are 20,000. And these 20,000 are mainly in the city center, which is basically a de facto tourist district. And so going back to, to your question, what happened for, for renters and for buyers? So for, for renters, obviously... This is a big uh, issue because when 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 Airbnb started to grow, that was in 2013, 14, 15. In both cities, we saw a process in which uh, landlords were replacing tenants with visitors, and so people was basically evicted from homes, and, and now landlords went into the short-term rental market. 
So this is a big, uh, big question. Uh, but this, the, in relation to this, there is another question, which is the lack of housing available for rent in these touristified neighborhoods. As I mentioned before, um, in the city center of Lisbon, all, I mean, the big majority of housing supply is on Airbnb. And so to find a house to rent in these places is, is mainly impossible. It's, it's very, very, very difficult. And it's not just evictions and lack of supply, but also this had an impact on housing uh, housing prices. Obviously, we we have more or less we estimate that landlords can take the double can double the profit in sh in the short term rental market that in the traditional rental market, and so of course this uh, has an impact on inflates. Uh, housing prices in gen uh, in general. On the other side, so we have we have the landlords and the and the buyers. Not 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 just buyers, but also landlords who bought in the past and now replace tenants with visitors. And so these property owners, so now the profits they are making are bigger bigger than before. Here we have a an a very important point, which is the inequality between landlord and tenant. So this inequality is increasing uh, a lot, and that inequality has increased a lot, especially in the, in the last decade. Not just because of Airbnb, but Airbnb plays an important role. And then the question of investors, so people who buy homes because of the short-term rental market. So we, we are seeing different types of investors entering in the housing market because of short-term rentals, and this is a new thing. So in general, I think Airbnb have consolidated a process in which the housing market is seen as an asset class for different profiles of investors. This, of course, existed before, but existed before in, in cities like Paris, London, Amsterdam, New York, etc., big global cities, but not in cities such as let's say Porto, uh, Palermo, uh, cities like where like secondary cities in southern Europe were not placed, were not a safe investment for uh, people looking for a, digamos, a place to deposit their, their capital. And now because of short-term rentals, these places have become a safe investment for, for these people. So basically, individual investors can buy a home, even they, they can buy us for a mortgage and repay the mortgage uh, in 10, 15 years because of the short-term rental, when before it was like 30 years, 35 years in the traditional rental market. So this is basically accelerating this bubble of asking credit to buy homes and which actually was was a, a bubble that exploded in 2008. So I think Airbnb is contributing for this. And, and, and actually, one thing that Airbnb is doing in places like the UK and the US, they have made agreements with banks in which landlords can not include the income from renting an Airbnb on the credit. So basically, when a bank give you a mortgage, they consider you your income from, from work. But now you can say, my income is from working and from renting on Airbnb. And so the amount of money they give you is bigger. So I, and this is where the bubble is. Because we have a situation in which if Airbnb stops and tourism stops, like in the pandemic, these people we face different difficulties to pay back the mortgage, for example. But then we also have people with accumulated capital that want to invest that capital in, in some place. And, and the short-term rental market gives them interesting possibilities because now you, you buy a home just to deposit the capital because it's safer than having that capital in the bank. But also you can rent to visitors, so you have an income from rent, but also because you can use it as a second home, so it, 
because the, the, the tenants, in this case, the visitor, only stay for a few days. So you repossess the, the property every week, basically. So the, the property is also available for you. And so you, it's a flexible product. You combine like second home with renting with the possibility of capital. And this is a very interesting option for, for individual investors. But also then, because the profitability is so high, in special in certain places, like in mature tourist destinations, that we are seeing institutional investors as well entering into this market, buying entire apartment blocks and converting entire buildings into, into Airbnb. There are different types of institutional investors also also doing this, I, I estimate that in Barcelona, half of the supply is owned by institutional investors in this way. Also, it's important to consider that the present moment in the last decade, we people call the generation rent. So basically, because after the 2008 financial crisis, so it's more and more difficult to, to buy a, a house and people go, going into the rental market. Considering that, the growth of short-term rental is making even more difficult for these people to rent homes. And, so, and, and this is very important and relevant going back to the question of inequality. Basically, we have a generation, generational between landlords and tenants that are increasing the inequality between young people and older people who has bought homes in the past. This is something that I think will explode in the future because a lot of our younger generation is not able to access housing and they are transferring big portion of their incomes to paying rent, which is not sustainable. Thank you very much for all these different threads, really complex processes that you have described. So if I understand well, we can uh, so go back a few, few decades before and just summarize uh, the beginnings of this process that uh, short-term rentals and real estate investments were a means for southern European cities to, to go out of the crisis, to uh, facilitate some economic growth. And uh, the policy changes coupled with different market mechanisms, the, also the, the way platforms work with network effects. So this, this grow into a much bigger scale of business than maybe it was originally intended. And it uh, unleashed this growth of inequalities, this struggle for local citizens to find a place to live, and uh, these different trends with, uh, with cheap flights, and travel preferences also mixed up with this with this economic f- fundamental of this of this whole phenomenon and now so can we say that that now we are in a moment especially in the cities of southern europe where we can talk about some sort of crisis some sort of major challenge for for a, for a way to go forward for for new generations on the on the rental market and on the housing market Yes, well, we have we have a housing crisis, which is I think global, but especially affects the rental market. So the demand for rent for the rental market grew a lot in the in the last decade, and so prices grew, but also the interest of investors for this market and also a policy framework that allowed this situation. And so in this context, the, the short-term rental market is another issue that is stressing even further the, the rental market. This is uh, for sure. And so and here, the, maybe the, the contradiction in, in policy terms is that after the crisis of 2008, so the short-term rental market and tourism was seen as a way to stimulate the economy. And so a lot of things were done to facilitate investment and back then a lot of people were saying well okay but this will create a huge crisis and also you are converting entire city center into tourist destination which is not sustainable for the life of people who live there and now so they are realizing oh yes you were right 
and the and and the problem. So what we see now is that several places, not just in Southern Europe, also in other cities, say are saying, "Oh, okay, we have a lot of short-term rentals. This is not sustainable for city life and for the rental market. So what we can do? We need to reduce, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. But but now when you get into this situation, it's very difficult to go back. I mean, to, to reduce the supply, it means that people who invested will lost that short rent on title and all the predictions that they made to imagine to repay the mortgage back they will be like broken. Okay, on the one side, I think that we need to reduce the number of short rental supply. But on the other side, some investors <laughs> have right in saying, this is not fair, you gave me a short rental title and now what? So this is this is the big challenge. How authorities will do this reduction in in numbers? That we need to do that reduction. Yes, I think for sure we need because it's not sustainable. But that will create like a a war between the private sector and and governments and and social movement. In a way, I think that we need we need uh, to do something about it uh, because. The housing crisis is very big in in several places, and not just the housing crisis, also uh, living in certain places. Yeah, so it's uh, it really strongly connects also to the discussion that is present in Poland related to the the housing market and availability of homes. So in Poland, one of the major, uh, let's say, uh, mottos of this conflict. Is a, is a saying that having a home is a right and not a product. And there's this conflict between an individual's uh, rights and prospects of, of, uh, of having a, a place to stay, in, especially in major cities. And on the other hand, all these unleashed economic processes that uh, where maybe the market is not sufficient in guaranteeing a fair situation for for all the citizens that's a that's a huge discussion um, everywhere in 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 europe i think and not only in the places most affected by short term rentals but before we jump in the policy questions the policy debate which is uh, running pretty hard for for quite some time uh, in your research you often use different qualitative research methods you you have uh, used field work in numerous of your of your papers so you have prepared interviews with different sides of this story tenants local residents but also people who are renting uh, uh, these places airbnb hosts or investors of of real estate can you maybe share with us some of the stories that you have heard some of the situations that you have encountered in, in Barcelona and Lisbon, in these two cities where you have worked and lived? Uh, okay, thank you for the question, Christoph. Before I answer this question, I, I would like to go back to your previous comment about, because I think that you said something very interesting which relates to the, to the liberal philosophy of economics in which the free market provides the solution and the services that population need. I, don't agree with that <laughs> philosophy and I just want to say a couple of things. For example, in, in Lisbon, using that liberal dogma, they said in 2011, we need to liberalize the rental law because landlords need to have more freedom in terms of what to do with the properties. And so if we create a framework that facilitates the life of landlords, so they will put those properties in the rental market and we will have more supply and prices will go down. That was the philosophy. And the opposite actually happened. So they gave all the power to landlords. And what happened is that landlords put the properties on the, rent, on the short-term rental market. Actually, the supply of rental in the rental market was reduced by a lot and prices were up. I mean, and this relates... With the other question that you mentioned, which is the, on the right of landlords to do whatever they want, apparently, with, with the properties, which is, again, part of this liberal philosophy. I think, on the one hand, that 
housing is a, an essential need in society. And so, and there are, we need to put limitations in terms of this right to do whatever they want with their properties. Because actually, it's not true. There are already limitations. For example, I cannot open a restaurant in my home. There are regulations to open a restaurant or a, a, a nightclub or something. But also, in a strategic sectors like um, energy, telecommunications, etc., there are very strict regulations. In, in, because they are very stra they are a strategic sectors and so the, the owners, the private sector and the investors, they cannot do whatever they want. This liberal dogma doesn't apply for strategic sectors. We need to include housing into that strategic sectors to make sure that housing serves as a social need, which is the, the, the most important aspect of, of, of housing. Saying said this, which is a very complex uh, issue, uh, and going back to your question about stories, of course, there are a lot of uh, stories. I did ethnographic work in Lisbon and Barcelona, and the stories are very different, again, if you are a tenant or you are a landlord. The question of, of tenants, so basically, on the, on the one hand, I, was, I managed to interview tenants that were displaced by short-term rentals, and of course, it is an unfair situation. But obviously, is is when I did interviews in touristified places, what you find there is people who stay, people who remain, people that were not evicted yet, but live in, in, the, in these places. And these stories are honestly are very uh, dramatic in sometimes, because to live. Um, in a place where you have an Airbnb upstairs or you are surrounded by Airbnbs is affecting the mental health of people. Even of landlords who are residents and don't participate in the short-term rental market, it's so stressful to live in such an environment that landlords are selling and going to live in different places. And they, and they say, well, this is not fair. Why? I invested all my time, effort, love, emotion, capital in this place in the last two decades and now I have to leave because it's impossible to live here. This is a dramatic thing. Also, the question of you cannot sleep and when you have to go to school or to work early in the morning. So it affects your health. It's affecting the mental health of people. Basically, the, the pressure to live in those, in those places uh, we need to relate with emotional implications and psychological implications of Airbnb and, and touristification in, in this case, not just with displacement. But then people, tenants who has been evicted, I, re I remember one, one incredible story that I, when I interview an elderly woman in Barcelona, that she lived all her life in the same neighborhood, in the city center, so all their network, social network, friends, family were in that place. So actually, that neighborhood was her place. I mean, the, the, the place that she controls and she feels safe because she knows where to go and the, the geographical meaning of, of the place. And she was evicted and she went to live in a, in a different very peripheral neighborhood of Barcelona, completely isolated, completely alone. What she does every day is to take a bus and go back to her neighborhood, her place, and to be with her friends, family, social capital, etc., etc. Because for an elderly person to be displaced in that way and to find herself completely isolated in a place where you don't know and you don't know anybody, it's basically something that as a, as a human right should be avoided. I mean, because what we see in that those situation is a deterioration in her health, in her mental situation, in isolation, uh, bad nutrition habits, etc., etc. So when, when you are an elderly person that you find herself completely alone in a place where you don't know anybody, that affects your life very hard. And so, and it's very, very interesting to see how her take a bus to avoid that situation every day, but every day, and go back to the, to the city center.
Well, and then on the contrary, uh, when I interview hosts and um, landlords of short-term rentals, well, there are also different situations. There are different profiles of people. On the one, on the one hand, we have the like the the middle class landlord who who said that ah, this is a I'm not an investor. This is just helping to pay my lifestyle. Uh, this is an extra income I have, which is the narrative, the official narrative of Airbnb. This exists, of course, because a lot of property owners are like small property owners. It's not like big companies that own hundreds of Airbnbs. But as I said before, so this is increasing the inequalities. And, and so these people is already privileged portion of, of society who have several properties, or at least two properties, and who always usually has a good job and good income. And this extra income is to maintain upper middle class lifestyle. And they justify this, ah, I'm not doing anything wrong. I just want to use this money to go on holidays, pay the university of my son, etc., etc. Which is okay, which is right, but this is their, their narrative. But then something that struck me was the narrative of like big investors in, in the city center of Lisbon saying, yes, residents should live. This is not a place to live. Like, leave us alone to make business here. You see that 70% of homes are on the short-term rental, so that implies a huge change in the life of the neighborhood. So now to live in this neighborhood is, is crazy. It's not, it's not appropriate to have a residential life in this place. This is a tourist district. And so recognize that this is a tourist district and leave us to make business. This is a narrative that exists. And, and I was like, uh, oh, my God, <laughs> thank you for being so <laughs> openly sincere. And then in Barcelona, I remember another landlord that had a, had a building with five apartments. And she told me, well, this is great. And because of the liberalization of the rental market, it was very easy for me to evict my tenants and put these uh, properties on Airbnb. And of course, she was celebrating that liberalization. So, so yeah, this is a struggle between renters and property owners. I see it in, in, in that way. Uh, and you can see that very clearly in the narrative of these two groups. Yeah, thank you for for these very um, powerful stories, and uh, I think it helps our listeners to also grasp the huge impact of short-term rentals in different cities, including uh, cities that are very important for you as well, Barcelona and Lisbon. It also showcases that on the one hand, we have the economic process, the financialization of, uh, of uh, homes, the way investments are pouring on the market, but also these other negative externalities that are affecting local residents, um, such as the mental health issues, this isolation, and also this disruption of local fabrics that is what makes a city tick, what makes, uh, what makes a cities a nice place to live. And uh, I think it is diff difficult now to argue that uh, regulations are not necessary to preserve places for local residents to live, to protect some of the housing supply, because I think we can all agree that, uh, that uh, something... Uh, dangerous is uh, de developing uh, across across cities. This is probably a, a moment where we have to put some barriers on, on the growth of this phenomenon. This is the and probably we are way past the moment where where we can where we can all argue that well, regulations are necessary to mitigate negative effects and to correct some of the harmful ways uh, our society and also economy works. And so your story is truly underlined that uh, at the moment where uh, people are losing their homes, not on an individual level, but we can uh, observe this on a, on a macro scale in the city where 70% of a neighborhood has been transformed from local residents to... Uh, to guests and tourists and digital nomads. 
this is a truly uh, a strong uh, situation where regulators, where governments, where also local authorities should should act and try to find a solution as well. You have uh, described uh, the difficulties related to that. How can you go back to a previous level? How can you also guarantee the rights of, of the investors, of people who, who invested in this market? How to find hero balance, social justice? So this is a, a complex problem. Probably we won't find a straightforward answer uh, to this during our, our talk. But uh, there are naturally uh, different regulatory developments, both in Barcelona and also in Lisbon and in other cities of the world. Can you maybe find some best practices, some uh, uh, situations, some, some solutions that seem to work, that maybe... maybe uh, um, push the market in the right direction thank you for the question very also very complicated and, and long well on the on the one hand i think we need to see short-term rentals in relation with other issues especially the hotels and the commercial landscape in those neighborhoods so because for me i mean the short-term rental market per se, is not just the, the problem, it's also the entire touristification of places, which also means that shops are transformed, are transformed into tourist services and also other housing are transformed into hotels, uh, etc. And so, again, going back to the economic crisis of 2008, because the solution for the crisis was like a, this liberal approach, we need investment, everything is allowed. So short-term rentals were, were allowed without limitations, but also hotels and also restaurants and any kind of investment into the place. And so what happened is like a monoculture of tourist service in these city centers. And the point is like going back in reducing the supply of this monoculture will imply not just short-term rentals, but also hotels and also restaurants, uh, ice cream shops, uh, tapa bars, uh, nightclubs, etc, etc. So it's a very, very, very complex uh, point because obviously that will imply that closing down businesses, like reducing the number of jobs, nobody will do that nowadays. It's, it's made no sense in, a, in our economic system to do something like this. The point is that you need to act before that that happened. And the only place that I know that act more or less quickly was Barcelona, that stopped the growth of short-term rental licenses in 2014, when they already saw a huge growth between 2011 and 2014, and they say, we stopped. They don't get more licenses. And in 2017, they created a, a plan that also affects hotels. Um, uh, hotels also stop, especially in 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 the city center. Uh, and also, they created like a land use plan to try to control the growth of commercial licenses uh, in general. But the point is that okay, they did that, but Barcelona is a mature destination, as I've mentioned before, and so already the place was touristified. At least they control, they, they could stop the growth of that. On, on the opposite, we see cities like uh, Lisbon, uh, or cities like I I Italian cities, where there is no regulation at all, where there is a, this monoculture of services for visitors in the housing and in the commercial landscape which is nowadays in Lisbon to open a restaurant in a street where there are already 14 restaurants. It's just to fill in an online form and they give you the license for the restaurant. There is no control whatsoever. And before the financial crisis, there were ratios. So the plan of the city said in this neighborhood, the ratio between housing and restaurant is imagined. Five restaurants for 100. I, I, I don't know exactly the number, but something like this. That was liberalized, again, to allow the growth of this. So the point is, now in a city such as Lisbon, I think public policies 
will do nothing to reduce this because that will reduce employment <laughs> and, and businesses and so nobody will do that. The only way will be with that again a mobility crisis like COVID and that the market will work along. But that obviously put us in a very, very vulnerable situation in which we cannot control the future of the city. That is something that should have been avoided in the past. And a lot of people were saying in the past, we are going in the wrong direction. The lessons for this is that there are still a lot of cities and places that will, that want to be like Lisbon and Barcelona. And that's the problem. They want, ah, we want to be part of this and we want to be on the map. And so we want to again do this. But okay, I think that I, I, I understand that the power of tourism to stimulate places, but where is the, the limit? Where is the equilibrium? And there is, and sadly, people only regulate uh, or mitigate the, the externalities when it's too late. And that is always has been like that. There is a dif different situation in places where there, is, where there is not a register. I mean, in Spain and in Portugal, we have a short-term rental register. So you are, if, you have, if you are a property owner and you want to do short-term rentals, so you need a license and a government give you the license straight away because there is no limitation. Well, in Barcelona now there are limitations, but in other places it's still open the, the register. But in other places, like in Italy, in, in several cities of the United States, in the, in the UK, there is not a register. So the, the property owners were operating on Airbnb and, and maybe they were, there is a control of the taxes they pay, okay, but there is not authorities, they didn't give anything, a title to them. So there was kind of illegal, something like this, like a informal market somehow. In those places, it's much easier to intervene, which is basically what happened in New York last month or two months ago. So they were not a register and now the municipality say, okay, we will create a register. And the conditions to be included in that register are very strict. And actually in New York, the condition is to rent an Airbnb. You can only rent your main residence and you have to be present in in the house so you can only rent a room you cannot rent an entire apartment if you want to rent an entire apartment you cannot include in the register so basically this registration for me in in one day the entire short rental market basically because they didn't give titles in the past so investors can not say anything about this which is very different than in spain and barcelona so basically what New York is saying, we want to go back to this original model of the narrative of the sharing economy. And it's very, very funny and ironic to see that Airbnb is, is, is the main player who is complaining about this regulation in Airbnb. So even if it, New York is using the main narrative of Airbnb, Airbnb is against it, which means that it was actually a narrative, not a reality. And I think that other places will do something similar if they want to reduce the number. In Italy and the UK, for example, they could do something like that. And I think, and I know that some municipalities in, in those places are thinking also in that, in that way, in that direction. Thank you very much, Augustin. So, so there is some hope for creating smart regulations in cities where the problem and the short-term rentals have not developed into such a huge scale as in as in Lisbon, for example. So registries are probably a thing that a thing that, that cities could implement, that they could uh, think how to mitigate the, the growth of this market in the future. And so this may be something interesting also for cities in Poland, where short-term rentals have yet to be regulated, and uh, where there's uh, at, the, at, at, the, at this stage 
rather an unregulated market where it's fairly easy to set up a new short-term rental. So this can be a, a way to think about now before things get out of hand. And there are some rumors about, about European regulations, about, about a framework for for providing access to local governments and, and uh, cities, access to data from these platforms. So that can also facilitate the enforcement of existing rules and, uh, and uh, rules that uh, can be taken into, into place. So there are some measures and some processes that are happening right now uh, that uh, I think local citizens should act upon, they should observe, maybe encourage actively their local representatives to to uh, to to act before before it's too late yes but <laughs> i'm a bit skeptical about this european regulation um because basically basically they took portugal as an example as a model and what they say is we need to create a register where everybody can register so local authorities knows who is renting okay but there's not a limitation so if everybody can register, we will have the same problem. This is one thing. And the second thing is that this sharing of data, they only share aggregate data, but not the address and the band number of people who is renting because of privacy issues. And so I don't think it will facilitate the enforcement of, of the regulation. I mean, in, in Barcelona, for example, they and other cities like Amsterdam, Paris, Berlin, municipalities have created like enforcement teams with inspectors that go and check door, door by door who is doing illegally the short-term rentals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's very, very challenging and difficult to find, actually, because platforms don't share against with excuse of privacy so we need we need more collaboration which it's a term that basically uh, is, is, is very tricky you know because when we think about collaboration we, we are we we mean we are recognizing that these powerful digital platforms have more power than local authorities to implement the regulation which is something crazy and then we're asking like a favor please collaborate with us. I think something different should happen, which is you we need this data because you are you are taking a lot of money from our housing market. And indeed in Europe Airbnb only pays taxes in Ireland, which is a tax haven. So they are profiting a lot from us and not contributing to society. And so, and then we ask them the favor to collaborate. So I, I, I think it's a fair system. And then the other, the question is that we need to, okay, we need a register, perfect, but we need conditions in, for that register. Um, uh, one condition can be like in New York, but also there are other conditions that you can implement, like ratios of spatial limitations. For example, in certain neighborhoods, the maximum amount of short-term rentals can be she's number. And these kind of limitations are very, very important. It's not just the register. Because when you see the, the this register implemented by the European Union, they, they sell it as something like transparency, clear market for all. It's, it's, not, it's not like this. It's clear market for property owners, basically. Thank you. So it's a uh, very important points were raised uh, now at, uh, at uh, for this for this final part of our for our talk. Uh, so that regulatory frameworks need to uh, have uh, I think a clear set of of also goals. So what kind of goals do we want to achieve with these regulations? What kind of negative effects we want to forego? And uh, I think it is very important uh, point that you raised that uh, information or data in itself is not enough and uh, policymakers should really observe what has happened in different parts of the world. Also, 
use empirical evidence that is already out there, what kind of regulations uh, worked, what were the overall effects in different cities. And uh, it's important to put all these things together and uh, create mandatory solutions for platforms and uh, um, be less dependent on narratives, on different uh, different ideas and put on some solid set of set of rules that uh, can preserve cities, also cities with a lot of tourists. Yes, and I just want to introduce a new element into the equation to complicate even further the, the thing, which is the question of monthly rentals, uh, rentals and temporary rentals and people who travel for a few months, not for a few days. This phenomenon has grown a lot also, especially after the COVID, remote working, digital nomads, etc., etc. Uh, and what we are seeing is that in cities that put limitations, like in New York or Barcelona, the supply is going into these monthly rentals. So basically two, three, four months. So you, the point here is that the, the property owner reposses the property very quickly. And that reposition allows it to increase prices and to have to control the asset, basically. Um, so they don't want unstable tenants. So the point is that this, mar this tourist market is making a situation in which housing is losing its social function and this is the big problem we have but the point is that in new york for example after that strict regulation the number of airbnb listings have remained the same almost the same the difference is that 20,000 properties are still available on the platform but you can only rent them for 30 days or more because a short rental license gives you the possibility to rent 30 days, less than 30 days. So if we want to retake the social function of housing, we need to do something about the temporary rentals as well, which is completely not regulated. And I, and I think I don't know any place in the world that has thought how, how to regulate this. And I know it's a huge challenge, but also we need to think about that. Yeah, thank you very much, Agustin. Uh, I think that during our discussion, we managed to highlight what what are the origins of short-term rentals, uh, how they transformed cities, what kind of uh, uh, what kind of problems they have maybe not caused but certainly strengthened, and how uh, how it affected local local residents. And we, we provided a brief summary of the regulatory discussion and also some questions for the future. So what, uh, what kind of uh, new type of, of, uh, of rental types may emerge uh, after short-term rentals? So these mid-term rentals or these monthly rentals that you have, that you have mentioned. So on ever transforming face in the in the real estate market uh, and in our cities so agustin thank you very much for our discussion it has been a true pleasure and i think a very insightful uh, discussion thank you very much i would like to also thank our listeners and uh, today's guest was agustin kokola gant from the university of lisbon and see you in uh, in our future episodes of uh, of our podcast, D Lab on Digital Societies. Thank you very much. The Lab on Digital Societies 